three years ago over on Skeptic, I wrote about Dr. Richard Carrier, who uh, you might previously have known as a guy who would turn up at atheist conventions talking about how uh, there was no historical Jesus, even though most historians disagree with him. Uh, I'd met him several times at conferences, hung out with him a lot, found him a perfectly nice person. Uh, but nowadays, uh, you might better know him as that guy who went absolutely bonkers and started suing people for millions of dollars for saying that he's creepy and for not inviting him to their conferences. So now his only fans are men's rights activists who are half rooting for him and half laughing at him. So yeah, it was three years ago uh, that Carrier decided to sue everyone into shutting up, particularly Amy Frank, the woman who uh, posted on her own Facebook page that uh, Richard Carrier had been creepy to her, that she felt that he had sexually harassed her. Uh, and Lauren Lane, who runs the free student-run conference Skepticon, uh, who decided not to invite him back to that conference, in part because of accusations like that of him being creepy. Uh, and bloggers like PZ Myers for, I guess, reporting on all of that. And also because free thought blogs tried to investigate his creepy behavior, but he removed his blog before they could even begin their investigation. So that's discrimination, I guess. It's creepist. It's creepist behavior. It's discrimination against creeps. Carrier used to live here in California, uh, but he moved to Ohio just prior to launching these lawsuits. And it's interesting because as a complete aside, I've been recently doing some reading on California uh, law. And California actually has some pretty strict anti slap laws. Uh, SLAP stands for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. And it's a convenient way to say it's a lawsuit that's main purpose is to scare a critic into silence. And if you were, I don't know, like a group of college students running a free conference for atheists who can't afford most other conferences, and if a speaker uh, that you didn't invite or that you disinvited said that he was going to sue you for literally more than $2 million, you might be willing to do what he asked, like remove whatever post he once removed about him and apologize and pay his legal fees. You might want to do that rather than go to court for $2 million, even if you think you're in the right. But if someone tried that kind of intimidation here in California, they would have their lawsuit thrown out before uh, the defendant incurs any uh, particularly great legal costs. But while 28 states, Washington, D.C., and Guam all have anti slap laws, Ohio doesn't. Anyway, that's just a fun fact. Uh, Carrier filed his lawsuit, um, which, just to clear things up, I am not educated enough to say whether that would qualify as a slap lawsuit or not. Uh, he filed in Ohio, though, um, despite the fact that none of the defendants lived or worked or interacted with him there. Uh, because of that, two years later, the lawsuits were eventually thrown out and Carrier uh, was informed that he would have to sue each of the defendants in their home states. The reason I'm talking about all of this now is because Richard Carrier has, in fact, filed lawsuits against everyone for the second time in their home states. He is suing Amy Frank in Arizona, PZ Myers in Minnesota, Lauren Lane, and Skepticon in Missouri. Again, as an aside, all of those states do have anti-slap laws in place. Just a fun fact. When I first heard this news, I was shocked because I happen to know that the defendants have spent tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees just answering Carrier's initial litigation. So I have no idea how Carrier himself could possibly afford another round of this. I mean, despite the fact that all of these legal issues have had a positive effect on his Patreon account. It's still, it's very expensive. And also I couldn't figure out what 1-800-LAWYER-ASSHOLE would possibly accept such a case as this. Uh, but then I double checked and it turns out he's representing himself. You know what they say about the man who represents himself. Uh, he has a creep for a client. I'm sorry, a fool, a foolish, a foolish creep. A creepy fool, like Joker, the Joker. Richard Carrier is basically Jared Leto's Joker. He's the Jared Leto of atheism. 
I mean, that's my opinion. It's not really for me to say. Uh, I would never actually state that as fact. That would probably be libelous, according to Richard Carrier's expert legal opinion. So Carrier is headed back to court. And I'm no lawyer, but I have uh, had quite a bit of experience with libel law. Um, so I know the battle ahead of him. He has to prove that the defendant said something untrue, that they knew it to be untrue, uh, and that they said it for malicious purposes. He's really going all out to prove that it's untrue. He's a creepy fuck uh, who doesn't recognize boundaries. Um, in fact, we have the evidence that he submitted in the previous court cases to look at so we can see, you know, how his case stacks up. So first up, let's see, uh, we've got a sworn affidavit of some lady who says that Lauren Lane once hugged her boyfriend and flirted with Richard Carrier. Huh. And that's that's about it. Um, I guess maybe this is saying that if you flirt with someone, they can't sexually harass you at any time in the future? Maybe? I don't know. Let's let's check one of the other sworn affidavits here. Um, let's see. We've got one from David Fitzgerald. Hey, I know him. He lives here in the Bay Area, and he, he seems like a nice guy. Um, oh, and according to his affidavit, he's married to the previous lady. Got it. Okay. David testifies to the court before a California notary public that he, let's see... Fucked a girl in a bed next to Richard Carrier, who was fucking Lauren Lane at the time. Wow. Sir, this is a Wendy's. <laughs> Why? Why? Can you imagine the judge? The judge who went, who worked all of his life to become a judge <laughs> is now reading about how Richard Carrier didn't. He wasn't creepy with somebody <laughs> because he had sex with somebody in bed next to this other guy. Oh, man. Yikes. Uh, let's see. David also mentions that Lauren seduced Carrier, who, by the way, is 16 years older than her. And uh, that after they had sex, uh, Carrier said Lauren was clingy and that Carrier ended the relationship and several months later, he told his wife about it. Cool. Cool. The court definitely needs to know this information. This is pretty open and shut. I don't know how anybody could argue that Richard Carrier is creepy after learning that he... Hold on. Hold on. Let me just check my notes again. Um, yeah. After he cheated on his wife to fuck a girl 16 years younger than him... While he was speaking at her student conference, while another old dude was fucking another girl in the bed next to them. Nothing to see here, folks. <laughs> Let's wrap this one up. <laughs> oh, hold up. There's actually one other piece of evidence that Richard Carrier himself has submitted. And it's an entire email correspondence he had with former skeptic blogger Hina Databoy. And... Well, I know we've already decided that Richard Carrier is 100% not creepy, but let's just read this over so we can just put that final nail in the coffin, shall we? Oh, Hina, you frustrate me. It seems like every time I'm getting up the nerve to hit on you, you post something like this, so I can't, because I fear you'll think it's because of that, some pity nonsense or other. Damn it! Parentheses. Before I continue, please feel free to cyber pat me on the head and say, poor man, I'm not that into you. Expecting you'd say, oh no, and I wish you hadn't asked, is one reason I've been putting this off, as I'd be mortified at offending a friend. But I hope you'll understand my at least taking a chance and being open about my desire, and a no certainly won't offend me. I'm also aware this is like some letter a guy might write to his love interest in high school. Eesh. I don't normally do it this way, but function dictated from this time even though writing this to you is scary, in parentheses. Okay, so this time I'm saying fuck it and just bearing my heart to you and being a little overly frank and forthcoming and just flat out hitting on you. It has nothing to do with posts like that. You are unequivocally awesome and you know it, which is unequivocally sexy. And I was hoping to talk about this in person sometime, but A, I don't know when that will next be, and B, once again, my previous opportunities kept getting thwarted. So I'm giving up on that plan and making an overture by epistle old-fashioned, but for it being electronic. I've been working up the nerve to tell you how much I desire you, although I am a little sexually intimidated by you, which only makes me more nervous. I don't mean as a life partner. 
I think you have your hands full there anyway. And by my wife's rules for our open relationship, I'm not allowed to have more of those right now. But as a sexual partner, even if just once, I admire you immensely. Your bravado, your power, your honesty, your intelligence, your character, your skill as a writer. And for me, admiring a woman is an enormous turn on. Competence is erotic. And sharing sexual experiences with incredible women like you is so what I want out of life. It only adds that you're pretty. Your eyes just melt me. Lots I'd want to kiss on you. What? But I don't have your permission to go there here, so I'll just leave it at that. When we last hung out, I had thought of asking you, especially that night we played Slash and you were the second to last to leave my room. But you were with Neil that weekend and he wasn't well too. And I worried it would seem wrong moving in there and, name redacted, wanted me. (laughs) And though I would have said yes to a three-way, I didn't think that would be appropriate to suggest not having discussed the possibility with either of you before. So alas, I didn't want to freak you out with any overture and spent the night with her. Quite happily, don't get me wrong, name redacted, has her own share of awesome, and we had a great night together. Anyway, you just radiate agency, and that's like a brilliant warm light you just want to embrace and experience passionately. I can go on admiring you from afar as a writer and activist and colleague and valuable asset to our movement, and I can go on spending excellent time together with you as a friend when we happen to be around each other. I won't be badly dejected by a no, but if there is any chance you want me, I'm hoping to know. Richard Carrier. www.richardcarrier.info <laughs> He and a data boy. Re, a polyamorous love letter, for want of what else to call it. Hmm, well, how can I say this? You must have mistaken me for someone who is impressed by multiple accounts of multiple conquests, thinks calling an RUDTF email a love letter is amusing, confuses getting a hall pass after getting caught rampantly cheating for polyamory, would think that someone would hit on me out of pity, and hasn't noticed the escalation of the way in which you've been acting and talking about and around me. I must have mistaken you for someone who'd get the hint from me not acknowledging and or deflecting the aforementioned hints you've been conspicuously dropping. Oh my god. (laughs) Hina. I am so proud that she used to be a writer on Skeptic. She got our start with Skeptic. She just destroyed a man. We just, she just murdered a man. It continues. Oh dear. Hina, I'm so sorry. I truly didn't mean to offend or hurt you. I'll not renew any overtures again. I really do believe and feel all the admiration for you I expressed, and that won't change. Everything I've said has been sincere, but I'll keep our interactions from now on strictly professional. If there's anything I can do to keep our friendship, let me know and I will. It does matter to me, quite apart from my unwanted desires. Otherwise, I will assume you don't want me to hang out with you in future, which I quite understand from your reaction." It would be helpful to ensure your comfort comfort from now on if you gave me some idea of how to greet you next time we meet. I'd feel compelled to apologize again, but you might not want that. You certainly might not want to hug, for example. By default, I'll just smile and say hi and ask after your welfare, unless you don't even want that. I really apologize for this. Hina. I'm fine with nothing about our interactions changing. (laughs) Oh my god, this is brutal. (gasps) Oh, this is so hard to get through. Richard. Okay, I'll be awkward, but that's me. After I last wrote, I've been agonizing over what I've done for a while on airplanes all day and realized I really fucked up. I should not have shared my thoughts and feelings with you without first asking you if you wanted to hear them. That's just wrong. I also realize I must have really ruined your day. So I apologize for that as well. I won't communicate about this again unless you ask. Richard. Hina. Just so we're clear, you don't have to agonize over telling me something. It wasn't sharing your thoughts and feelings that was a problem. It was everything else I mentioned. (laughs) Nothing was ruined. I'm not of the belief that communication is a wrong thing. Richard. No, certainly. Indeed, everything you said was true. That is my life as you described it and how I live it and the nature of the relationships I have. But I shouldn't have assumed you wanted to be a part of it or would even want to be asked. It really matters to me a lot that you be respected and that I not cross boundaries I shouldn't or make you uncomfortable for any reason. And that was all where I went wrong and what makes me feel awful. Hina. 
You've been hinting heavily at this for months now. If you want to feel awful, feel awful for months of my wanting to tell you no, but not being asked in a direct enough way for me to just say no and get it over with. It gives me no pleasure to reject anyone for any reason. I have no desire to make anyone feel awful. Richard. This actually makes me feel a little better, if that's the case. I don't feel awful because you said no. Oh, dear, no. Your rejection is fine. I feel awful because I so clearly offended you in my approach and in other respects, at which I realized my approach was atrocious and must make you think horribly of me, which makes me feel awful about myself, not you. As someone I admire greatly, your opinion of me matters to me. I'd paraphrase Elizabeth Bennet. I can't bear the thought of her being in the world and thinking ill of me. Only I feel more like Mr. Collins presently than Mr. Darcy, so the analogy is off. I'm not kidding when I say I value our friendship. I'm perfectly fine with you being a no on anything beyond that, and will always be. Yes, there will be a little private pining for you. (laughs) He calls his dick little private. Which I will keep to myself, but that's not feeling awful. You can even openly mock me for it henceforth, and I'd be amused, not hurt. Not that I assume you would. I'd just genuinely consider it funny if you did, because I'm weird. (laughs) Richard, again. I'm not sure now whether we are on the same page about what just happened, so I apologize for this one. I have to fisk your initial reply, so you might see my thought process upon reading it. This is hours moved, and thus with far less horrified emotion. Don't read on it if you don't care, though. Just if you do. When I said your reply was entirely true, that might be hyperbole, but here is what I mean. Quote, you must have mistaken me for someone who is impressed by multiple accounts of multiple conquests. That's true enough. I didn't mention thinking you'd be impressed, and I don't think that, nor do I reference my relationships with women as conquests. But indeed, I may have been mistaken in what your opinion of my discussing my promiscuity with you might be. It was offensive to you. I did not know that until now. Unless by impressed, you meant only amused, and you are amused, in which case your statement may be spot on, and that's how I initially read it. Quote, things calling RUDTF email a love letter is amusing. That's even more the truth. You have reduced it to the harshest and most blunt distillation, but alas, I would consider it ghastly to actually exclude all thought and feeling and reason in expressing any RUDTF. But you distilled it to essentials. That is what I expressed, and I did not conceal that. And I, indeed, could not think of what to politely call it, so tried a terrible joke as a substitute. And you were definitely not amused by that, which, in hindsight, upon your observation, was a warranted reflection. I felt rightly chastised. Quote, confuses getting a hall pass after getting caught rampantly cheating for polyamory. Here I am assuming you are referencing my implied assumption that all polyamory means open relationships, and that, by contrast, you are not claiming no polyamorous configurations are like mine, which so far I've only ever told you my side of, not my wife's, because that's her business. Assuming I read that right, I did not intend to imply that, but intention is not magic. I was actually trying to ask if that did fit you or not, clumsily, badly, horribly. I should have just asked that generically first, so that I would even know before putting you in an uncomfortable place as I did. Or second, first should have been, can I ask you a personal question about your polyamory? To which a no would have concluded the matter, and a yes would have led to the next question about what sorts of relationships you and your partners would consider. It was that realization that haunts me now. I did it wrong, really, unthinkingly wrong. Otherwise, getting a hall pass after getting caught rampantly cheating is an accurate description of the course of my life, incomplete for having only my half of the sequence of events. But that's presently irrelevant, as I don't believe the whole story should matter. Your sentence remains true. We met a crisis in our relationship and decided to redefine it. Quote, would think that someone would hit on me out of pity. I don't. I was worried you would think someone would and not be amused. So here my concern was your perception. Here, as I am sure you would confirm, accurately described which stung. This has been a concern of mine since you wrote the following, not a reference to pity, but to not being sure of someone's motivations owing to the context, which has haunted me because my desire and my admiration are equally real. And yet the last thing I wanted is to give you any reason to think the one was just a proxy for the other. You deserve your praise. You have earned it and continue to. Just because that turns me on should not undermine your faith in that. I hope not. Quote, and hasn't noticed the escalation of the way in which you've been acting and talking about and around me. Entirely true. I didn't notice any noticing at all. The closest to come was your staying next to last that one night when leaving me and name redacted on the same bed and shortly texting me after you left your fun when you're drunk, which was wholly cryptic as to signaling interest, disinterest, or neither. That's not an excuse, just a description of my lack of noticing. And again, everything I've said about you publicly and to you privately has been entirely sincere and true and remains so. It's not a game. It's what I actually think and feel. Quote, I must have mistaken you for someone who get the hint from me not acknowledging and or deflecting the aforementioned hints you've been conspicuously dropping. Also true, as evidenced by my failing to get that hint, it follows that I'm de facto not someone who would, which is mortifying to realize, and yet another thing I've been apologizing for. Hence, again, you have accurately described my, the reality. It was the wording of all the above, deliciously brutal, that made me realize I'd offended and hurt you, by my being so insensitive and daft, and not having thought this through better, and thereby giving you the easier no you would have wanted. The irony of being so deftly and succinctly pwned by a woman whose skills as a writer I admire is not lost on me. Indeed, being the weirdo I am, I admired that even as I was devastated by what it meant you thought of me. Does he have a humiliation fetish? Real question. But the point being, all these are the things that I took away from that assessment. As for my life, occasional sexual relationships with women I admire and befriend, plus a single life partner is the life I want to live and do live, with the full knowledge and consent of all concerned. That is indeed true. This in no way means I don't care about whether I treat any women in my life with respect for their feelings and wishes, though, which is why the realization of having harmed yours hurts. It doesn't hurt because I can't have you. It hurts because I hurt you and perform badly in the eyes of someone whose judgment matters to me. Hina. 
You haven't hurt me, harmed me, or offended me, as I said. I'm annoyed at worst, and now, glad to clear the air, which has felt murky for a while. Richard. Annoyed at worst, noted. Thanks for interacting on it. I appreciate that. If there's any more murk you want to clear, let me know. Otherwise, I'll just return to normally scheduled programming. Yep, definitely not creepy. Not creepy at all. Definitely very into respecting boundaries. Definitely not at all into continuing a correspondence long past the point where it's appropriate. Definitely able to take hints, and by hints I mean direct statements. And definitely chock full of self-awareness to know what to submit for public review by a court of law and what not to submit for public review by a court of law. Look, I love cringy stuff. So this is basically like catnip to me. It's cringe catnip. As much as I hate that the defendants are going to have to keep paying through the nose for this idiocy, I am really excited for more high quality cringe from the next phase of discovery. Um, Let's get carriers full text exchanges. Let's go. Uh, If you'd like to help the defendants fight these lawsuits, you can make a donation over on GoFundMe or on Skepticon's websites. The links will be over on my Patreon in the transcript. Um, I'm just going to wrap up by postulating, what if Richard Carrier is right? What if this is all smoke, no fire, despite the emails, the sworn affidavits that he himself submitted to the public record? What if he really does understand boundaries and has never, ever made someone feel uncomfortable? What if his number one named accuser is lying when she says that she felt sexually harassed? Many years ago, I was regularly harassed, non-sexually, by a batty woman named Uh, She did a lot of truly shitty things uh, to me and to other skeptic writers. And her usual MO was to lie about everything. Um, For instance, she claimed on Twitter that I made an anti-Semitic joke about her saying that someone overheard me at a bar in Austin, Texas, a bar that I was never in because it doesn't exist. Um, Also, I had no idea she was Jewish. Despite that, she managed to get a Jewish anti-bullying organization to offer to help her. She said a lot of things over the years that could definitely fall under the category of defamatory. uh, But by the time the Jewish stuff came up, I had had enough. So I decided to speak to a lawyer. And the lawyer wisely pointed out that essentially, yeah, she's saying defamatory things, but uh, she's a moron. She's clearly a moron. And legal action would not fix that. Uh, In fact, it might not make her shut up. It might make her even more annoying. And I would be paying for the privilege. Ultimately, I had to accept that the court system is not there to be my parent. It's not there to send someone to her room for being an annoying little shit. Uh, ignoring her was the only path. Uh, It kind of sucked, but sure enough, it's been several years now, and this is honestly the first I've thought of her since that time. Uh, Everything she tried to do to libel me, including starting a knockoff skeptic site, failed miserably. My point here is that if Carrier had done that, he wouldn't currently be known as a litigious creep. A woman posted something on Facebook that he didn't agree with. A few other women agreed with her. Richard Carrier himself agreed with her that he had previously violated the Secular Student Alliance's contract that prohibited speakers from having sexual contact with students. A student conference that didn't even pay honorariums disinvited him. A blogging network asked for his side of the story. That was where we were. He could have, at that point privately offered his side of the story or just moved to an independent blogging platform. He could have apologized for the mixed up communication with the women involved who felt that he sexually harassed them. And he could have moved on. Skepticon stopped inviting me to every year's conference. And guess what? It didn't affect my tax returns at all. Uh, Go to different conferences. There are plenty out there with including ones with no rules about speakers having sex with audience members. But instead, he chose the nuclear option, suing half a dozen bloggers and student activists and people only marginally connected to any of this 
just because some women felt uncomfortable with his advances and had the temerity to say so on Facebook. Come on, Carrier. Like, you gotta take a step back and see what you're doing here. It's not a good look. Um, I don't think that they caused $2 million worth of damage, even if they did lie about you. That's my opinion. Please don't sue me. But it looks like your Patreon's doing really, really well these days. Just saying. So anyway, if you're watching this uh, and you do want to help out the defendants, please check out the links. Throw some money their way. They're literally being pushed into debt by these ridiculous lawsuits. Whether they the lawsuits have merit or not, they have to pay a lawyer to fight them. And it sucks.